I am Jeremy Gold, co-president of Blumhouse Television. Blumhouse Television is a wholly independent uh, television studio uh, it, with infrastructure from top to bottom, from everything from casting through post-production. We are a division of Blumhouse. Blumhouse uh, was in the television business prior to Marcy and myself joining uh, just about exactly four years ago. Actually, it's about our fourth anniversary. Um, uh, and the company was in the television business prior to us joining in a producer for hire capacity. Um, and the goal of bringing us aboard was to essentially build an independent studio, which is what we've done. So we um, have the ability to deficit finance, which we do, and we have the ability to sell everywhere, which we take advantage of. Uh, and the um, just broadly, the, the creative filter is a little broader than our very successful feature uh, colleagues uh, at Blumhouse Productions, where what they do is almost exclusively uh, horror with some notable sort of exceptions. Any conversation today, we have to address the pandemic, um, which even when it comes out of my mouth, like global pandemic, it sounds like we're all in the same science fiction movie together, but alas, here we are. Um, um, and so to talk a little bit about how the pandemic has affected um, our business and our company, I, I'd start with, you know, just thinking a lot about talking to, to you all today in advance of this, um, no matter what business we're in, it all starts with the human element to this. Um, and as a senior business leader, I feel a great response, as do the other senior leaders at Blumhouse, a great responsibility to our, uh, to our staff and to the artists, the incredibly talented artists we work with. And by artists, I mean everyone from all the, all the department heads to, to all the outside vendors to the obviously the right, incredibly talented writers, directors, actors, producers we work with. So, so number one was, it has always been since, you know, February, March, when this all kicked off, was really about, you know, first take care of everyone. Um, and I mean that, that's really has been the, 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 the priority guiding principle and do things safely. And that's, um, you know, that's for anyone in this, uh, trying to, to, to lead during a crisis, I think. No matter what, that's not unique to entertainment, certainly, and certainly not to Blumhouse. Um, um, I think... Now to speak more kind of specifically about us, I, you know, has going way back to my, you know, <laughs> independent not-for-profit theater days in New York, of which I'm very proud. Um, you know, I've always been a big believer that your limitations define your style. And this has really been an exercise in limitations um, in every way. And Luckily, it's kind of germane to, to the Blumhouse ethos. And I'm not taking credit for that. That was there when I got there. You know, mad credit to Jason Blum and Charles Layton and the team that built that company before I and Marcy, my partner, arrived. That was the ethos there. And we've just carried it forward um, with them. But the ethos has always been adapt and improvise and find a new way and innovate. We're always innovating. Um, again, I'm not saying that in both ways. A lot of companies innovate. But that is definitely the core of this company. Um, and, you know, I've worked at, you know, studios and networks, big and small. And honestly, that is not the ethos everywhere. It's actually less, you know, the ethos at the bigger, the bigger the company, I think it's hard, the harder it is to be a real innovator. So that's a long way of saying we were trained up for this, you know, not that anybody wanted to be in a pandemic, but the idea of like, oh, we can't do it that way, we gotta do that way. That was a move we had because we're doing that all the time. Now, this is extreme, um, but, um, you know, it's been about really finding, um, you know, uh, new ways to do things. And um, the, the, the goal from day one, at, you know, following number one goal, which is keep everyone safe, was let's work to finish and work to deliver in terms of the material that we were already making or in many cases on the television studio side, we had lots of pieces, David, that were, that were wrapped. And now we have to deliver them to the, to, the, to the end user, the network or, you know, platform. So, um, we found some clever ways to work around through post-production as well, um, uh, as well as production and development. But look, uh, in brief, I, in cl closing on this question, I'd say this. The, the pandemic has changed the way we approach just about everything from development to production, obviously, to and happen to report we're back in production, uh, especially on we're back in production on a few things which we can talk about safely, of course, adhering to all the guidelines. and. Um, certainly post-production, 
Um, and also just less sexy than all that, but just sort of the workaday business. How do we all adapt? Um, and lots, boy, everyone, everyone's figured out, you know, oh, working from home is a thing. We can do that. Um, so across, you know, the world, people are loving the joys of working from home. To now talk about sort of some of the specifics of how we've adapted through this period. I'm actually going to start with the creative because I think it's sort of interesting to say this, which is um, <laughs> there, there, prior to this, there's always been, because we're Blumhouse and the kind of material we tend to traffic in, we have always seen a rather uh, large number of pitches and material and existing you know, um, intellectual property in the arena of pandemic. Um, uh, we also, since the beginning of this, have received a great number of pitches for things that like, oh, and it can be all done on the Zoom. Um, and I'll say it was about week two where personally I found myself at home thinking, if I see one more commercial that's done cleverly with one person alone in their home and talking to six other people who are all in little boxes, I'm gonna go crazy. Because like a lot of business professionals, I spend my day living in this little box, talking in this little box, and then everything we order comes delivered in a little box. Our whole lives suddenly we're all living in boxes. And I didn't want as you know, as 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 creators of great material, or hopefully great material, we didn't. I felt like people were done with that. I mean, I just, so the, the other thing I'd mention is I don't know when this is all over and it will be over, you know, one day that um, people really want to dwell too much on a world where we all were trapped at home and couldn't interact with people on the street. Um, I don't know much. We want to live in that space. Um, so what I, what has surprised me in a good way is that, a lot of the, the artists and the buyers have all just sort of like, let's crack on with it. Like, just let's talk about other ideas. I mean, when, you know, so, so we, we, once everyone sort of like picked themselves up and dust themselves off and thought, okay, this is what's happening now. We just kept developing as we always develop and look for ideas like we always look for ideas and hunt and gather material. So, um, and look for things that have nothing to do with this period. The, the, the one side note that I'd sort of offer that I just think is interesting is, I noticed just, you know, myself and my family and in viewing things now, when you watch something now, almost everything feels like a period piece. What I mean by that is if you watch some movie and like, oh, it's the big wedding scene. It's like, oh, remember big weddings? Yeah, that's nice. It feels I mean, like everything's a period piece, which is sort of strange because we don't do those things. Or even just the scene and three friends go meet at the bar and have a beer. Like we can't do that. So that is, you know, a period piece. So. That's been sort of interesting, but again, the, the, the smart developers uh, you know, and buyers are thinking about these things are gonna be on the air in two years. So let's not be thinking about this moment that we're in. Um, now on to the sort of specifics, um, I'm gonna start actually with um, uh, post-production because that was an essential need, especially in the television studio, we had to, 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 we had to complete material and, and we would be, be good partners to our platforms and deliver the material um, so they can put something on the air. Uh, and we found some very clever, you know, uh, ways to work in economies of scale in order to have post complete from home. So, and lots of companies did this. This is not so special, but we did it on, you know, several different things simultaneously, both films and, and television series. One of those ways, I mean, obviously we're lucky in the world of editing editors. Like a lot of my editor friends I work closely with, they're like, my life hasn't really changed. I get up in the morning, go into a room by myself and clickety clack all day. And, you know, and often that room is already in their house anyway. So, so we leaned into that. In a couple of cases, we sent our editors some additional equipment so that they could do, for example, we work closely with Technicolor as one of the color correction houses we work with. We had Technicolor outfit one of our executive producer editors with the same kind of, um, the same kind of material he you know, they would use a Technicolor so that in his own home, he, he could, in his home office, he could color correct the show along with the cinematographer. Um, similarly with sound, we actually found a way to sound to sound mix. You know, sound mixes typically are done with, you know, anywhere between six and 12 people in a room together. Well, that's not happening. So we found a way to outfit um, our, you know, post-production team with the space where two or three people could sit and, and get a you know as 
close to a great mix as they possibly could, output it to those of us who would usually sit in that mix with them. We watch at home with the best headphones we have, send in our notes, and Bob's your uncle. Um, and that, honestly, um, I think that's worked very well. Now, for someone with an incredibly highly tuned ear for perfect sound, is, is the resulting show as excellent as something we would have done a year ago? I don't know. It's probably pretty, pretty damn close, I would say. We have a very exciting um, 2020, um, despite all of this, um, in terms of material that was is set to come out and with, in the coming months through the rest of the year. Um, uh, first up, um, the, the, well, we, well, I should say this. We've been launching, you know, we, we make a number of streaming movies and we have a very close relationship. We have this wonderful relationship with Hulu and we've released 22 movies on Hulu in a series called Into the Dark, which are all... There are 12 standalone holiday themed horror movies that drop the first Friday of every month on Hulu. And we've done two seasons, thus will be 24 when we're done. In fact, we premiered one at C21 in London um, uh, about a year and a half ago, which was, which was quite a lot of fun. Um, so we've, a few of those have premiered while we've been in, 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 in lockdown. And it's been fun. We've done, um, you know, we typically do screenings for every one of those for all the filmmakers and friends and crew and some press. So what we've done instead is we've done virtual screenings where um, you know we'll come on and introduce the filmmaker. The filmmaker will say a few words, and then we'll show the we'll show the film. Um, so we we have premiered a few of those, um, including one that just dropped on Hulu uh, last week called "The Current Occupant." That might be the movie we all need to see right now because it's a bit of a sci-fi thriller about a man in a mental hospital who wakes up and believes he is the president of the United States. So is it, so the movie sort of asks the question, is it more likely that a man in a mental hospital thinks he's the president of the United States or that the president of the United States is locked up in a mental hospital? Um, which uh, it's, uh, yeah, it is oddly the perfect moment for this movie and Barry Watson stars in it and he is extraordinary. Um, but in terms of upcoming material, we have more of those dropping. We also on uh, September 25th, this was just announced, we launch a, uh, very high-end docu-series on FX called A Wilderness of Error. Now, Blumhouse, before uh, before we launched the studio, Jason Blum and the team had produced The Jinx on HBO, which is extraordinary. And so we followed in the footsteps of that. We've made a number, a number of these series. And our next one is A Wilderness of Error, which follows the Jeffrey McDonald murder case. Um, uh, and uh, based on the, not the book, A Wilderness of Error by Errol Morris. And Errol Morris is actually on camera and in this series. So we're very excited about that series. And um, shortly after that, in early October, uh, we launched another series we're very excited about called The Good Lord Bird on Showtime. This will be our second kind of premium, well, our third premium limited series. We did Sharp Objects a few years ago on HBO, which we're very proud of, and The Loudest Voice on Showtime last year. Uh, and we're about to launch in October, The Good Lord Bird, uh, starring Ethan Hawke, and he's sick news by Ethan Hawke. Um, and based on the National uh, Book Award-winning novel, The Good Lord Bird by James McBride, incredibly talented American novelist. Um, and that is um, also, you know, very much a series for this time because it is, um, uh, it is historical fiction, but surrounding the life of abolitionist John Brown. Um, and the days of bleeding Kansas and his work to abolish slavery. And it imagines a relationship between John Brown, a young slave boy named Henry Shackelford, who uh, was disguised as a girl. And they strike up this very unlikely friendship um, and friendship. Um, and Onion, his nickname is Onion, um, travels with John Brown and John Brown's sons and his band of merry crazy men uh, as they're riding across the country, you know, uh, uh, about doing everything he can to end slavery. As, as, as James McBride says about John Brown, um, he was a terrorist on the right side of history. Um, but without, you know, John Brown, I mean, in fact, did do uh, probably more than any, you know, anyone, any single human to, to, to abolish slavery. Um, but it's a tremendous cast that also features David Diggs as Frederick Douglass and this incredible um, young newcomer named Joshua Caleb Johnson who plays uh, the lead role of Ethan Hawke, um, and um, gives an amazing performance and actually grows up before your eyes because he, uh, 
he literally, uh, you may be embarrassed to say this, but I think you'd like it. He literally, um, he, well, he aged from uh, 13 to 14 while he made this show, or 14, 13 to 15, and he grew 10 inches. Um, so you literally want, but luckily we shot chronologically, so you watch him grow in our show. But anyway, there, there we go. That, that comes out in, um, in October. It, it's very interesting to spend time contemplating at this moment how all of this will change our approach to storytelling um, and everyone's approach to sort of receiving storytelling. I mean, one, one so there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I think, first of all, we hope that all of this has really brought about awareness, awareness about so many things. I mean, this, I, to me, it is not coincidental that the, the pandemic and, um, and, and, and the very much needed um, rise of the Black Lives Matter movement have coincided at this moment in time. That is not an accident. Um, and you would hope that we all will come out of this with a different, I mean, there's from, from the micro to the macro, right? A lot of people just anecdotally, I've heard friends say like, wow, I, I never realized I liked my kids so much. I've had so much time with my kids or, you know, uh, although I don't like being a full-time teacher, <laughs> you know, some have said that with the younger kids at home. Um, but, but, but also in terms of the way we all, uh, approach each other, um, Right now, I observe, and you know, look, I, I, you know, live in a big American city, um, and right now there's, I think, a real sensitivity when you're out in the world. And I'll, I'll bring this back to, to film and television making in a moment, but there's a real um, sensitivity. Everyone, when you walk, if you when you do go out in public and into stores, and everyone's masked up. Everyone is on eggshells with each other. A, they don't want to invade people's space, and B, I've noticed. You know, there's a lot of racial sensitivity and everyone's being very, almost people are, no, no, after you, oh, no, 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 after you. Everyone is so careful with each other in a way that I'm, <laughs> I've never seen. I've lived all over the world. Everyone is just, I mean, on eggshells. And I think that's good, but we have to get over that. I mean, like any sweeping movement, the pendulum swings too far and then we'll, we'll, we'll swing back. So... That's a long way of saying I, we will all come out of this with a renewed awareness. But in terms of storytelling, I think, um, look, I think the audience is more demanding than ever. Why? Because people have been stuck at home since March 11th watching everything they get their hands on. So, you know, you'll suddenly hear someone talk about some classic television. So, oh, yeah, I watched all five years. It wasn't that great. Like, you know, it's like the bar has gotten higher because everyone's watching everything. It also has been real, created real opportunity. And I think those opportunities continue. Um, I think people have, have found, you know, um, I think on the last, over the last, you know, really 15 years, we've been in this trajectory with the audience where they're becoming more educated in, in the kind of, you know, television they like. They're, you know, for example, real novelistic television writing has become um, a thing that everyone's used to. So, you know, you wouldn't have a, you would not have a Big Little Lies or Sharp Objects. You know, we, those shows stand on the shoulders of The Sopranos and, and Breaking Bad and, you know, the, 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 and um, Mad Men and going way back to The Wire and Oz, you know, the greats that kind of kicked off the, the cable drama business um, in a meaningful way with a slower burn in novelistic writing, as I said. So, so I think the audiences are so used to that kind of programming now. And, and now you'll see great opportunity for something like um, uh, The Last Dance, you know, the incredible uh, Michael Jordan and the, Win and the Bulls documentary, where that caught fire um, in a way that I don't know that it would have caught fire had it not launched during this period. Um, uh, but uh, I, think, I think going, so I think my short answer is, I think all this has raised the bar of excellence. And I think those of us who are content makers have to continue to work uh, twice as hard to find what makes things special. And, you know, that's part of the um, DNA of, of Blumhouse and this comes from the movie side. You know, um, uh, you know, Jason likes to say in our, in our, in our horror movies, we like to always smuggle in a little social commentary. Um, and in some cases, a lot of social commentary. And that's certainly become, when we started the television studio four years ago, we embraced 
that and, ex and continue to expand on it. So I think only more so is it, um, the onus is on us to continue to do that. I believe that our business is certainly changing on the daily. It has for the last several years, and this all of this is only going to change it uh, 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 more so. I mean, we have had seismic events in the in the entertainment industry um, uh, over the last several years, and certainly right now. And you're seeing, you know, you know, your good, well, positive changes in the in the WGA um, negotiations, and you saw the UTA sign the deal as well, which is great. And, Others will probably, and, and Curve and others will probably follow suit. And, um, but you also see things, you know, at big agencies, you know, giant uh, head cutting, uh, which is sad to see. I think when you talk about the streaming platforms, I, you know, it, it appears to, 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 to many, I'm not the only one to say this, but I don't, I mean, they're just not going to make it all. Uh, they're not all going to make it. I don't think there's room for that many streamers and i think we're we are very much in the streamer wars and you're going to see that more over the next few years and some will fall away they just will i also think it's very very challenging time for the independent studio i'm saying that as as a senior leader at an independent studio um we have a unique kind of attribute thankfully knock on wood in that we have a very um a very meaningful audience facing brand at blumhouse um which i think is 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 uh incredibly helpful and meaningful I hope you know between that and a number of factors that that we weather the storm well, and I believe I definitely believe we will. I think for some of the indies, it's going to be very very hard. And um, as 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 the world becomes more walled off at those uh, at the streamers and one of the bigger companies who have their own captured studio companies, it's harder and harder for them to to want to do business with outside studios. Um, but um, at the end of the day, I think you know content makers um, are really going to be in the catbird seat. People that are able to to really start from the you know IP, whether that's an amazing spec script or a novel that you're adapting or a podcast, and take it all the way to excellent execution and on air from soup to nuts. I think those will be the winners because everyone needs content. So. Um, so I, you know, in some ways, yeah, yeah, is it scary? Sure, it's scary. But also, if we can weather the storm, I think it's never been a better time to be a content maker. I'd like to think I've learned a great deal during this period. Um, it has certainly not been without its challenges for all of us. You know, um, you inquired about me personally. You listen, I, you know, I, I feel very blessed. You know, I have a. Thankfully, my family's healthy. Number one, we have a, a you know a nice place to be locked in. I'm you know gainfully employed, thankfully, and very very busy. In some ways, busier than ever. Uh, uh, so for that all, I'm enormously grateful. I think this has all forced all of us to kind of pump the brakes. Um, and it's funny, you know, my just to share anecdotally, my wife says she's like, I I don't think I can go back to that other life. I don't think I can go back to the running around town and, uh, and get, you know, someone to a tennis match here and run home and make sure there's dinner and run that way and this way and then get to the premiere and run to, you know, so it's forced us all to sort of slow down a little bit. Um, and for me personally, it's really made me think like, wow, that was crazy. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, we're just as busy, but doing it all um, or most much of it from home. So I think it, the, the one lesson I've had is like, just maybe just, don't always move at 150 miles an hour. Sometimes 80 is fine um, and be just as productive. Um, so I think for all of us to kind of get off the hamster wheel of life a little has been really positive. In terms of storytelling, look, it's never been more important for our storytellers to help us out. What's the old song, send in the clowns? You know, when people are upset, they need clowns, send in the clowns. And I think I, you know, just recently I've, Gotten to know this incredibly talented young artist named Sarah Cooper that I'm sure all of you've seen. If you haven't, go get yourself some Sarah Cooper. She um, helps us understand what our our American president is trying to say. Um, uh, but she's, I, you know, what she does in essentially lip syncing speeches from um, President Donald Trump is like providing a public service. It is, I'm using her as an example, but it is genuinely helping to heal. And I've always believed in the healing power of cinema, always. Um, and I think um, that's definitely on us. I think, 
Um, you know, there are notable examples. There, I mean, it happens in giant ways. You know, there, there are, you know, Spielberg Schindler's List was, I mean, that was, a, that was a giant healing moment for a lot of people. But it also happens in smaller ways like a Sarah Cooper too. So I think all artists can find a way to sort of help, you know, <laughs> help us all through this. Um, and um, I, I think uh, uh, people are craving for, A, some answers somewhere. But B, sometimes it's just good escapist fun. You know, I've I've recently enjoyed this this series Rami on Hulu, which is phenomenal and dropped me into a world I sort of knew a little about, but not a lot about. Um, um, and it's specific, and it's you know his personal journey, but I can get things from it. So so uh, you know, um, it, uh, uh, I think we all uh, now need you know fun, healing, entertaining stories. Uh, more than ever. And we also need to bring, push some negative things into the light. You know, that is what we did. And we, that is core to our, that is core to our business at Blumhouse, which is very much intact, you know, things like, you know, the loudest voice, that's what we were doing there. Um, and uh, certainly, and certainly, you know, um, uh, uh, and oh, oh, and one thing I should mention, by the way, um, we, when I mentioned what's upcoming um, for us, in October, we also are beginning to launch. Um, we have made eight movies for Amazon, all from underrepresented filmmakers. In some cases, these are first-time filmmakers um, or nearly first time. We're enormously proud of these, these movies. Amazon have been phenomenal partners and um, look to see those. We're, pro we're probably four are going to premiere um, in 2020 and then the other four in 21.